The Spin-Off Podcast Network. Are you making the most of your KiwiSaver investment? Generate is an award-winning KiwiSaver provider with a track record of strong long-term performance. Making a smart decision now could add tens of thousands of dollars by the time you reach retirement. Book a no-obligation chat with a Generate KiwiSaver advisor today at generatekiwisaver.co.nz slash advice. A copy of the product disclosure statement is available at generatekiwisaver.co.nz. The issuer of the scheme is Generate Investment Management Limited and, of course, past performance does not guarantee future returns. I'm Toby Manhire and this is Juggernaut, the story of the fourth Labour government. A podcast in six parts. Doesn't give my opponents much time to run up to an election, does it? This nation is at risk. What do you think you're up to now, you perverted little liar? I can smell the uranium on it as you lean towards it. <laughs> There's a radical overhaul in the history of New Zealand's administration. Juggernaut, the story of the fourth Labour government. Made with the support of New Zealand On Air. Listen now on the spin-off or wherever you get your podcasts. But they, their love was thwarted by COVID. It's oh like... my god! <laughs> oh. I can oh, see the one-man just... show just with him and an exercise <laughs> bike know. on stage. Tēnā koutou katoa. My name is Toby Manhire. It's July 2021, and this is gone by lunchtime. Annabelle Lee Mather is away sunning herself, gallivanting, who knows what. In a new place today, Ben Thomas. Welcome, Ben. Kia ora. Uh, replacing Ben Thomas, we have Mahingalangi Forbes. Kia ora, Tēnā Mahi. koutou. Kia ora. What's up? Well, funny you say. <laughs> <laughs> this is a bit of a setup. So I was thinking this morning, mm. as I was listening to a story on the radio about a gentleman called Fa'amwana Luatutu, mm. who... Um, was giving evidence in the Royal Commission of Inquiry into State Abuse. He's the first of the Pacific Island uh, 15 that are going to be giving evidence. And one thing he said is that in his first day of school, when he first arrived in New Zealand, the teacher said, your name's too hard to say, your name's John. Hmm. And so he became John from there, and he talked about how that was the beginning of his of the dispossession and fracturing of him and his culture. And um, I was thinking, how names are so important. And then I came in here this morning, and I talked to Te Ahe, and I said to him, do you have an affiliation with dolphins? And he said, yeah, kind of, you know, because that's what his name is, and his mum named him that because he had beautiful... Te Ahe is a producer. Yeah, uh, he had beautiful rivalry. big black eyes when he was born. Mm. And so, you know... You know, Māori, we have names which we kind of grow into. That's what I think anyway. And we're all taking our names back in the rest. And I was thinking, Annabelle, Grace and Beauty, Mm. Toby, Tobias, God is Good, and Ben, Blessed, Child of Fortune. Is it? Yeah, do you think you've like lived your name? Um, I would like to think there was meaning imbued in uh, every part of names like Toby and Ben, but I don't know if there are. I kind of wish there were. Ben's quite blessed. Tell us about Mihingarangi. Mihingarangi, greetings to the heavens. Huh? Yeah, or, you know, to the days. Mihi as in uh, greeting and yeah. nga as in plural and rangi as in skies and days and mm. rangi nui. Mm. That's my great, great grand auntie name but my kids have got all Maori names and I feel like they live theirs yeah yeah can you tell us what they are Paido is my oldest which is uh, the place where the spirits the the hills where the spirits go on the other side Hmm. and she's (coughs) very is definitely that person Uh, Tiahi Paudewa which is like the burning platform like Paudewa is the sky tower modern day Paudewa in the old days it was just probably um the watch house or something in the par and is obviously on fire one day and so she's very fiery and um yeah and then Pele is someone means my darling and he's definitely that and Taika is <coughs> and he's full of life uh, and you didn't think about Ben um in another life I might have <laughs> yeah I'm because I'm you know I'm decolonizing so I want my children to identify with their culture and feel like they're part of it Ben's a lovely name I I, I want your children to identify with this podcast and feel part of it yeah, okay the yeah. tw- the 20 year old will <laughs> yeah yeah Definitely. Oh, yeah. All, 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 20, all 20 year olds are into this politics podcast. Yeah. Speaking of podcasts, it's huge. Your, your rival podcast, Party People, Party People, uh, 
is returning. Is returning. Me Forbes. Yes, later this year. Uh, on another platform. Um, is, is that going to be broadcast live from the Kawaro pub? Oh, I wish. We're going to try and make it and sound like That's it is. That's a good idea. We could do a, we could do a Gone by Lunchtime Party People collab. Oh, we could do a Party Kawaro People RSA. lunch. Yeah, a sh- Party People Shane lunch. Would, Shane, Shane, would, token Shane would lay a table for that, eh? Yeah, definitely. Okay. No, it's going to be lots of fun. It's going to just be politics through the lens of... Some Māori fellas <laughs> who've been around politics <laughs> with me kind of in the middle, yeah. telling them, shh, and Annabelle, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pinch Grace and Beauty back to produce it. Mm. Okay, well, that's good. Well done, Annabelle. The well, should we just call her Grace and Beauty? Grace and Beauty, yeah. GMB, GB, G. Grace, Beauty. Grace <coughs> and Be- Beauty, Laughter. Lee Mather. Laughter, lols. GBL. Well, she's lols because she's lady of leisure. Yes. Today. Oh, and yeah. And Rarotonga. Mm. Yep. Kia ora. Probably Bells. cracked her third champagne by now at the Kōru Club. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the pineapple daiquiris. She's got it attached to a bag. <laughs> she never the Kōru Club basically to herself, wouldn't she? Or just, just the other Rarotonga Just Rarotonga her and her husband. Travelers. Yeah. Oh, the other, yeah, there would be a few of them though, wouldn't they? Oh, yeah, I think the flights will be packed. But she'll be able to get, she'll be able to get a, uh, a phone charger. She'd definitely get one of the comfy little cubicles with a phone charger, a cocktail, and she'd have her, um, there'd be lots of scrambled eggs there. It's quite good. One thing that COVID-19 has managed to do is make the Kauru Club exclusive again, at least the International Lounge. It was losing a lot of its cash. I haven't mm. been into of, it. Yeah. When yeah. did you go on the International Lounge? Uh, well, last time I've been, I was in it was when I was visiting my folks in Sydney pre-COVID. So you don't know whether there's lots of space in there. Well, uh, it's just I mean, I know, and I know it's pretty big, and there used to, you know, there used to be a lot more people travelling overseas. Yeah. I mean, I don't think they would have like roped it off or anything. It must be difficult <laughs> because, as we know, typically the Kōru Lounge is the place where you get a read on Middle New Zealand. You just stand in the middle of it and chat to people. <laughs> But when it's just Annabelle and her husband going to go on <laughs> Getting a lot of feedback about the importance of politics, multimedia funding another, and structure. Another reason that politics is really hard now is because it's harder to get a read on ordinary New Zealanders in the Cory Club. The, yeah, the, the it used to be that that's where all the po- politicians would be and they'd talk to you. Hmm. But now I feel like there's an exclusive wing of the Cory Club and then there's like security guards or something, you can't get near them. Yeah. The, the, the greatest one, of course, remember, was when uh, Jacinda Ardern opened someone's beer for them. No, oh. no passed the bottle opener to someone, and yeah. it became a big story. Yeah. It was one of the great wow. moments in New Zealand history, just, in my opinion. She's just like us. Um, so, demanding the debate is some, one of the things that has been de- – the debate has been demanded – um, Many debates have been demanded. And the problem with modern life is not enough discourse. The demanding on the discourse on the debate. We need more people airing their views. Mihi, you uh, saw the demands for the debate and you responded to the demands for the debate by issuing an invitation. To everyone. To everyone. To, to everyone from every party. Yes. To debate. The demand. The ma- yeah, the demand of he pua pua, mm. uh, in particular. It's he pua pua since, specifically. Since then, right. which was only like last week, there's been multiple new debates that have been demanded. I see it's like almost every the day. Debates. There's we need more debates. debates. More. Oh, I'm like, oh, can we just talk about he pua pua first? Can we not move on? What about if we had a national conversation? I love it. Wouldn't a national be, conversation, mm. that's been called for. I national. think, a na- no, I want it to be more of a journey that's going forward. So I think a national walk and talk. Oh, mm-hmm. like um, mm-hmm. like in the West Wing, yeah, just like a national POV, <laughs> yeah. steady cam, <laughs> and we'll make it multiple parties, <laughs> <laughs> just all news of the team of five million all going for a stroll around the block, yeah, just to get their hearts moving, the ideas flowing, yeah, okay. yeah, we could do it, and we could shoot it all from the back of a Ute. True, and with a couch on it. we could put it on a cycle lane and then we'd have the entirety of New Zealand politics encapsulated in one That's frame. That's actually not a bad, bad idea, Toby. You know how not the second idea. demand the debate billboard was like, ute tax, question mark, here, poor, poor. Hmm. And when, you, when I first glanced at it, I was like, 
Ute Tex here, Pua Pua. And I was like, Ute-tex. what is this? <laughs> Did you think they had um, misspelt and it was Utu Tex? I, yeah, I, well, that's right. I didn't know what well, Ute it was. I mean, I, I, I thought that's some, maybe that's something that's sort of on page eight or onwards of Lordy Made Easy by Scott Morrison. Utu Tex, yeah. I thought, yeah, they, they, rather than demand the debate, they could remand the rebate. That would be... Remand the rebate. <laughs> that would that's be... perfect. And, um, and, and the other side could reprimand the reprobates. Suffice to say, my demanding of the debate <laughs> hasn't been that fruitful. Oh. Um, I mean, I've got a couple of people through the door, um, and it's, I'm in delicate, critical conversations Oh, right yes, now. high-level conversations. High-level, and mm. I can't give too much away no. because I don't want to ruin anything for us. Okay. Um, but I still feel optimistic. Anyone listening out there from politics? Haramai? No, my haramai? That's, that's all of them, isn't it? Yeah, all of yeah, because yeah, they will listen. Yeah. Uh, ben Thomas, demand the debate as an approach, an oppositional strategy. Is it a good idea? Has it worked? What's going on? Well, it means you don't have to take a position yourself, which is, you know, there's just this implication that so oh, maybe something bad's happening. You can fill in the blanks. You know, we need to talk about this. So is demand the debate the assertive cousin of just asking questions? Yeah, I think so. And it's a few steps down from, um, you know, the kind of ramped up sort of quote unquote separatism talk that Collins unveiled when she was first talking about um, the Māori Health Authority. Mm. Then when Hea Pua Pua came out, she had obviously dialed that back, taken on a bit of feedback that that was like a little, a little too obvious <laughs> and had Turned it into, you know, uh, what was it? Uh, separate, separate systems, co-governance, mm. evil co-governance. Um, and now it's just, well, maybe we should just talk about it. Maybe mm. we just need to talk about it. Why won't the Labour government talk about it? And in a way, um, you know, she's got a point with some of it. With her pua pua, you know, the Prime Minister has said we didn't release it because we thought people might um, attack us on it. <laughs> You know, she's been pretty clear with that. Um, and, you know, Hea Pua Pua itself was definitely kind of slipped through, you know, or, or the attempt was to slip it through. Mm. And now it's mercifully turned into just a national debate where everyone will sort of have their say at a few hui and meetings and they'll draw up some A4s and some long lists of ideas and sticky note walls that everyone will take photos of with their mobile phones and turn into PowerPoints and nothing will really happen. Um, But there will be a discussion document. Um, So I think, you know, this isn't a particularly fruitful road for National to go down. But now that they're adding in extra issues... Um, you know, I mean, the, the mob the mob funding is, is the most obvious one that's a real sort of pressure point. Um, but that's know. not a hair poor poor. No, no, absolutely. I, I think, think hair poor poor is a dead end mm. for them, I think. And, and I, I, mean, think I think it makes it, sense that they're moving on from that. If they had of, um, actually just talked to it, there were, there's a number of uh, examples they could have used as successful here poor poor uh, frameworks and uh, concepts like the Māori Health Authority is basically that concept of working in treaty partnership um, and you know what what's coming with Oranga Tamariki might be similar as well but um, I wanted to say about the debate I remember a time when as journalists we were able to actually have debates on television, on radio, and I think it was actually the national government that came that. Do you remember? When yeah. they said we, we will no longer put ministers ne- up yeah. against We're their not going up shadow against that person. spokespeople. And, and that, so that, prior that was to that, a really we used deliberate to, policy. Great point. Pr- right, well, was, that, to, was that under the national government? Yes, it was, because yeah. prior to that, we'd, you'd have like like sure. Sainsbury and those guys, yeah. and John Campbell would yeah. have like one of each, yeah. and they'd just be half an hour of just going each other. Here are the two people who wish to be responsible for this portfolio. That's right. Let's hear them. Yeah, or big stuff. And, and talk about policy on. rather than it's just right. leadership stuff. I and mean, they got canned and they wouldn't front. Let's demand that debate. They, then they demanded that they would have like an interview and then that would finish and the next person okay. could talk. And so, and then, but this Labour government has carried that on. And in fact, they're equally as poor at turning up. 
Great point. We uh, hashtag demand the debates. That's what we're doing. We're demanding the debates. Well, sh- what could we bring back the debates? Bring back the debate. Bring back the br- br- like back in the not, day it's debate. Not very literative, is it? But see, the problem is people are out of practice at it. So bring I, back. I, bring back the Barneys. I remember the first time that we actually did. You know, our, our ministers did engage in a debate, and it was was it the twenty eleven election. And I thought was it twenty yeah, it was twenty eleven, I think. Or maybe twenty fourteen. Uh no, it must have been twenty fourteen because it was Joyce versus Robertson as finance minister. Mm. Uh, finance minister and finance spokesperson or finance spokespeople mm. for the two parties who were in the election. Because it was an election campaign. Yeah. And it was <laughs> the the mood <laughs> um after it, it just turned into this absolute shit pile where both of them ended up just sort of slinging mm. insults and talking over each other. Who facilitated? Uh, it was the nation, I think. But it, it was, it was, or maybe it was q and I can't remember, but... It was just so terrible. You know, I think we got official word that, you know, look, we've got a couple of couple more of these that people have already signed up to, but no more. Mm. <laughs> like, <laughs> no, I disagree. I think that if you've got a good facilitator, you can make it work. And I think that as, you know, I think New Zealanders have a right to hear um, that kind of policy debate. Yeah, and they have, I mean, you know, every election they have, for example, the would-be finance Ministers debating in Queenstown together. Yeah. That's always a lively and interesting and often illuminating affair. I think that there are when you talk about issues like uh, whether it's whether it's hipurpua or oranga tamariki or health or education. To get the the complaint we have a lot here a lot is that there isn't enough discussion about policy. It's all just about personality mm, and it's all about right. flashpoints and gotcha politics and blah, blah, blah. And then we don't get a lot of illumination or light very often in question time either. We get a lot of obfuscation and avoidance and attempts to score hits. I think, I think that's a great idea. We're demanding the debates. Um, me, how's your, how's your diary looking? You're available to host all of these debates. Happy to. Great. Happy to. Um, I mean, we smashed out all of those election um electorate debates, yes. if people turn up, it's not that hard. I think that that's part of the other issue, isn't it? That National seem to have been, ca- well, actually not National, Judith Collins seems to have been carrying on this, well, just asking questions, guilt by association, implication, strategy through to question time. She used to be a really ruthless kind of forensic questioner. She did. Um, One but- of the best portfolio uh, opposition Politicians and very good as ministerially, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but against Ardern, she goes with these very airy, big picture things. And this is whether she's talking about hate speech. I saw um, a clip about uh, the you know the the state funding of media, which is basically just you know a bit of a handout, mainly for oh, yeah. audiovisual that stuff. Was a Facebook, one, I think. Yeah, and. And Collins was just asking these sort of very high level, easily rebutted questions about, you know, does this mean media are biased towards yeah. the government? Uh, I mean, that's she not going to get you anywhere. That media were take, the, by, uh, drinking the Kool Aid. Yeah, then, and, then Seymour swooped in and said, well, one of the criteria is that it, it you know, that it, it uh, demonstrates of the principles of the Treaty of Waitangi. What if somebody, want, what if a media organisation uh, runs a, an investigation into whether those principles are any good? You know, does that mean that they don't get funding? And, you know, that's actually a much more reasonable, that's actually a much more incisive question to ask because you're getting into the detail and the policy and what it actually means for media um, rather than just these sort of, you know, but basically suspicious kind of um whims or something and you know you, you notice that a lot I think you know Act Bridges has actually been pretty good I think you know say on the hate speech stuff um, but you know the leadership of National really seems to have adopted this well you know why don't we just talk about it you know all why can't we talk and then you say well what do you want to talk about what do you want to know and then it's just all vagaries we want to talk about no how numbers. we're not allowed to talk well go why don't you, why don't you speak now well I, I, what I want to say is that I'm not allowed to speak <laughs> it does become almost it's like a, it's yeah, a yeah. sort of reservoir 
opposition politics, where it's like everything goes in there, right? You know, so mm. demand the debate just becomes this catch-all mm. for everything. So the farmers protest, the, so the, the 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 funding of the meth program and its relationship to the mongrel mob, the, you know, the, everything. Let's just let's just chuck it all in there and demand the debate. And it, it it's it's at once trying to cover off everything, but it also ends up being so nebulous. Yeah, so it's, it's trying to create this narrative that the government is acting outside its mandate and doing all these things that it never campaigned on, which, you know, most governments, 95, 99% of what they do is not stuff they campaigned on because most of what government does is really boring and doesn't attract a lot of attention. You know, the the day-to-day business of government is stuff that most people don't even become aware of. You know, say, for instance, grant funding, you know, Um National didn't have a policy on whether they would fund Harry Tam and gang connected meth programs either, because you know you don't think to your policy is one page long. Um, they're not funding Harry Tam, Ben. They're funding a program run by Harry Tam's yes. company. Yes, yeah, but they're funding a, a program that is uh, helping people become not addicted to meth, which is going to be beneficial for all of us and the community. This is the Kahukura program, yes. yeah, funded through the Ministry of Justice, I yes. think, the 2.75, and the, this has very much become part of the demand debate debating, it's which one of is, them. Uh, uh, and it's, it's, it, it's being presented as um, uh, the government is funding the mob, which is... Yes. Yeah. Which, Which is, is not, it's not really. What not it's doing quite. is it's legitimating senior members in the mob. It's basically saying this gang leadership uh, buddies, you know, they're, they're, they're establishment people, they can get money, the mongrel mob are actually out there to help you get off meth, which is not really true if you look at the national picture. <laughs> um, um, and, and, but, you know, <laughs> if you apply that that to say, the Salvation Army or a church that, you know, has actually been part of the Royal Commission on Interstate Abuse and acknowledged that they've got, had some terrible, terrible abuse in their ranks, you can't then just say, oh, the whole of every single church organisation can't be funded. And we give lots of money to those organisations for them to help to do social justice work in our communities. So you can't apply that to every single group that's trying to, you know, uh, uplift their people. Yes, we know that gangs are terrible most of the time, um, but there are individuals inside of those gangs who are now in positions where they want to help and who aren't peddling um, drugs and the rest of it. And um, they are the best people to try and to try and encourage people to get off meth and things like that. Yeah, but I, think, I think you have to be careful about that. Yeah, I think I think the idea that um, you know the 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 superficial kind of public perception is gangs are bad, drug dealing. Then you've they got are the, bad. The, yeah, then you've then you've got the second layer down, which is the kind of. Um, point shiv sued sort of gangs are just alternative Fano institutions. They're basically like Fano aura providers. We need to <laughs> empower them to help the most vulnerable in the community. And then you get back to, then you drill down into the reality, which is, is like, actually, you know, actually pretty bad. And the, the idea, the thing is, I think there's a difference because, you know, there's all, there's so many programs around the country, right? And uh, most of them involve gang members, right? Because that's, that's a core. Not enough. Programs. That's a core part of it, right? And you, you, yeah, you're right. You won't get anywhere without former addicts. You won't get anywhere without people who understand the lifestyle. I think that's a different matter, and I think this is something that the public gets gets intuitively, even though it doesn't get articulated. It gets articulated as funding the mob. Which is that when you've got a guy like Harry Tam, who you know, look, look has had a long story you know, career of public service, etc. But his, his main job during that time has been stakeholder relations for the mongrel mob. He's a corporate social responsibility slash PR guy. His job is to make you think that the mongrel mob are, respon- are a responsible social organisation in the same way that the sustainability manager of Sky City tells you, like, look at, look at all the good we did. We had a fun run and raised some money and just forget about all of the people, like, feeding their paychecks into the slot machines and pissing into cups. And... 
you know, so so the idea of legitimating those senior figures, who actually, you know, the most the, the most important thing they could do is actually try and pull the levers in the organisation and use their influence to get people stop dealing meth to their fano, right? In, instead of kind of picking up the pieces and going, well, of course we don't, you know, on a human level, I to, you totally. Does it have to be one or the other? I mean, yeah, I mean, uh, the thing is, is literally we created this mess of gangs, and um, I just. You know, in my experience of the people that I've dealt with, and I've dealt with lots, and and I actually have gang members in my family, and I don't want them to be gang members, but they have had really, really difficult lives, and I'm fortunate that I am actually white, and I haven't had the same kind of um, discrimination and uh, uh, trauma, actually, because trauma actually fucks you up. And so anyone who has experienced trauma, whether you're brown, white, or whatever, it just happens to be probably more Māori and Pacifica people uh, uh, have had this kind of state abuse trauma. Um, we have to find a way of healing them and lifting them out. And so addictions and abuse and violence and gangs are just consequences of that trauma that they experienced at the hands of the state. And I know you say, Ben, that it's not all, you don't, not everyone who's in a gang was um, in state, uh, state abuse, but, you know, it was literally only six, seven years ago, I remember saying to, asking Ann Tolley and um, Bill English at the time, you know, you know, People are calling for an inquiry into state abuse, and they were saying, "No, we don't need one. We don't want to, you know, let lying uh, sleeping dogs lie and all those kinds of things. We'll re-traumatize people, blah blah blah." And you know, at the time, they were saying that we were overestimating by saying eighty thousand people during that forty mm. years. Today, they say two hundred fifty thousand. That's a quarter of a million of our kids in state care have been traumatized and abused through our system. It's only makes sense that we have a growing massive gang population and culture as an impact of some of that trauma that's come through. So they are the solution to stopping it, to turning it around. But and, but every single gang, you can't be in control of, you know, that's the, that's the whole nature of gangs. You get to do what you want. You've been locked up and shut up and abused and in, in these... Uh, in these in homes, cares, whatever, in your environment, that again gives you freedom. So of course you're going to have a whole lot of people making decisions for themselves. So I don't imagine Harry or um, Eugene Ryder, who's you know still associated with the Black Power in Wellington, but doing amazing things down there, can control every single member of the chapter from Wellington. But he's doing his best. Yeah. So. I, I think that's an interesting point because, you know, Harry brought up all of those issues on his Q&A interview with Jack Tame, where he said, you know, this is where Jack Tame said, who's joining gangs? And he said, well, you know, the numbers aren't really going up. What's actually happening is it's just third generation. It's the kids, Family. it's the families going up. There's, vi- <laughs> there's a video of Harry Tam speaking to a mongrel mob audience from November last year where, you know, with a lot of zig hails and stuff thrown in because that's the audience and he's a good PR guy. He knows how to talk to people where he says, you know, all the gangs are actively recruiting now, not passively recruiting. We're all muscling up. So that's quite different from where, you know, we're dealing with this residual pool of damaged individuals that we want to lift up. They, they are actively recruiting. Everyone knows that. And th- so I think the idea of legitimating them as a, a partner with government, as people who, you know, are respected by the prime minister, by you know, uh, is is probably a mistake in terms of branding if you actually want to keep people out of that lifestyle. And you saw the contradictions with that, you know, in Potter Williams's interview with Tame, where at the on the one hand she's trying to say, you know, she wouldn't even speak Harry's name. She was like that person, you know, and and then she was saying, oh yeah, but I mean, good program, two point seven. But that's million. that's about the that's about the raw politics of it, isn't it? Thank you both. That's a really really interesting corridor. Um, this has gone by lunchtime. And um, if you want to hear more fascinating, interesting conversation like that, you can help keep the spin-off alive by going to thespinoff.co.nz and joining our membership. Are you curious about how business can be better? I'm Simon Pound, and I host Business is Boring, a podcast where I caught it all with some of the most interesting people in entrepreneurship, commerce, and making things happen. Tune in to Business is Boring every Tuesday, brought to you by the Spinoff Podcast Network in partnership with Smart Business Lab. 
Kia ora, I'm Alex Casey, Senior Writer at The Spin-Off. We wouldn't exist without the ongoing support of our generous members. If you're able to, you can make a donation at thespinoff.co.nz slash donate. We need to talk about the groundswell, the howl of a groundswell, howl of a protest, farmers, utes going down the highways of the nation to the cities, across a range of cities. It was a... I think it was still going when I came here. Came here this morning. Through Morningside, yeah, mm-hmm. lots. Lots of tractors. There, there, there lots were, there of three, double three, cab three, utes. Three, three yeah. SUVs and utes at the intersection to was you know, there, try and get across oh, the road. Was, was there any None. mud on the utes? None. No mud on the no, utes? No, they were pretty shiny. They were in there. Best paint job for the protest. Um, there are actual real tractors <laughs> rather than Ponsonby tractors in, 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 in Auckland on Friday. Big John other Deere places. ones. Um, and ties. there were also a lot of interesting signs. I it, mean, looked was, pr- it looked pretty cool uh, with um, the tractors, there I was, thought. There was, we don't, we, I mean, it's, it's very in- easy to misrepresent a protest on the basis of uh, fringe elements, we could say. But... There were quite a few <laughs> interesting signs there. And to, when we talk about, you know, uh, demands for debates and different no catch No idea how ute the, tax has anything to do with ramming te reo Māori down your throat. Yeah, yeah I didn't yeah. get that one. It's, but it was a theme. Where is the te reo being rammed? I mean, it's being rammed down the throats, but in what location it's is that ute. happening? It's because, the ute. Yeah, the, <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> the right. Ute. The ute is getting it. Um, is it the, what is it, the daily COVID briefings? Is it because Ashley Bloomfield says, says Motu? Motu? I think yeah. it's probably it all of TV. It is that. It's the TV3, the TVNZ, it's everyone saying the kia ora. No, oh. my, how do my, as you said, tēnā koutou this morning. Yeah. You know, we're starting to embrace and love our other language. Shocking. Um, the other one I'm most interested in, though, is the, the um, did you see this one? Fish plus chips plus communism equals your worst nightmare. This was a sign. I love fish and chips. That was, and I just, I don't you can't really, one out. I'm trying to get my head around, because it's, it's my, a very interesting equation. Are they talking about on a normative level, like everybody has fish and chips, there's surplus production and workers' committees, just uh, everyone gathers together and they just dump a big bag, you know, a big package. Mm, of mm. Maybe because it's fish isn't meat. Right. So it's like, um, you know, moving away from red meat and eating more fish. Like, But what about where do the chips come in then? Because potatoes. Potatoes, you yeah. can't eat. Plants. Yeah. You can't eat plants. So, you can't so eat plants. Maybe it's pescatarian protest. I think it might be a reference to Jacinda Ardern having previous. I think this is somewhere in the Morrinsville region. Yeah, it's a, it's a reference to the Prime Minister's to, to teenage job. A, yeah. but, but I just, I mean, if you were, let's just say for argument's sake, I know that you're um, uh, in favour of Marxism-Leninism, Ben, but if you were against communism... Wouldn't adding the fish and chips make it less bad rather than more bad? Like, if your worst nightmare is communism plus fish plus chips. Maybe they're saying that you would there would be long queues for fish and chips, and then if you had ordered two fish, you would just get one, one potato fritter. <laughs> Because every like or, in the Soviet a, Union, yeah, yeah. you don't get to choose. You don't get yeah. the cho- choice of the family pack and upgrade right. to the snapper. You right. just get the same. <laughs> so okay. you just get the hooky yeah. frozen. Yes, because um, because of the working situation. Grant, Grant Robertson would go like with no the productivity commission. Gunny Shinana would be like everyone's having a sea dog. Yeah. tonight and sixteen <laughs> chips, a crab stick, <laughs> which contains no crab meat. Yeah, so. It means, I don't want to dwell on this, but it's important. It means that fish and chips under a communist regime is your worst nightmare. Is that your interpretation? That person needs to come forward and explain well, you're himself. you're welcome to. They need we, to debate. We, we demand. They d- de- I'm demanding debate, the debate, debate on that. It's going to be episode three of the, de- the debates you demanded. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, the, quite a lot of organisational heft behind this. 55 centres. That's a yeah. Well, let's effort. talk about it properly. We should do that. And it's and it's um, there were there were, there are a number of issues beyond the fish and chips, communism, and te reo. Few. Um, there's all the water policies. 
There's the the Ute the, the Ute tax. There's the, the significant natural area stuff is quite interesting yes. because people feel um, I didn't that's get one Hone Haru where it's extremely I saw the, the, the irony of them the, of farmers from the Waikato <laughs> asking yeah. for their land back, yeah. and I was like, I actually asked that question because I was horrified by it, and then someone's like, Ugh. SNA, Mahu, do some reading. <laughs> and I was like, I'm deleting that text. <laughs> I was just getting a torrent of well, abuse from... Uh, and I was like, yeah, cool, thanks, I've got it now. Thanks, but stop with the coming at me. Um, <laughs> but now I get it, it's the significant natural uh, areas, and so that's the bits of forest and original ngahiri and wetlands yeah. on their lands that they're not allowed to That's develop. That's right, saying but that this is our land. why would they develop it when you... Just, I mean, have we... The weekend's weather... Hello. Well, this is actually something that um, Hone Harawera is really up in arms about as well, up north, and yes. has been leading because um, they're worried about the, the effects on developing um, to Tutu Whenua land as well. Um, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I think the I think some parts of the country have successfully just put in place their significant natural areas ages ago, but some councils have been dragging their feet, and that's where the sort of controversy has come in because it, it yeah, I seems think down like south I remember a story of somebody who lost a portion of their land. Well, not lost; it's still there for them to enjoy, but they were unable to develop a. Yeah, I don't know I think the answer to that question, but there will be a, taken care of. There will be a piece about it on the spin-off explaining everything you need to know tomorrow morning. Because Thank you. it's um, yeah, it's an interesting area, and it was one of the things that was raised by a lot of people who were spoken to who didn't have signs about fish and chips or te reo. It mm. was a, w- the, 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 a lot of people raised it and, as part of the protest. One of the sort of the um, m- more general complaints, I think, is that there's a lot of stuff you're doing to us at the moment. It's like too hard and too fast, right? Like it's it's it's. Um, Interesting, given there have been a lot of complaints about the Labour government continuing the incrementalist path from various quarters. Is this suddenly Ardern's Labour government is too transformative? Well, what what this government's really good at doing is passing regulation. They're really good at stuff that involves having officials write something down and then signing it off by an executive council order or passing a law. They've been terrible at delivering things. But passing a law is literally the act of <laughs> governing. Doing something. Yeah, the, the, yeah, that's right. It's, it's 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 performative in the true sense, in the sense that by do it oh. by by performing it, you do it. But but what I mean is that you know where the argument has been about the transformation has been that uh, you know the, apart if you leave aside the welfare advisory group stuff. Um, most of the problem has actually been delivery. You know, it's been getting that $1.9 billion out the door and actually more beds for mental health and more counsellors and that kind of thing, and literally getting it out of the bank accounts. Yeah, or execution, um, you might say. In yeah, execution, way, implementation. Yeah. Um, well, we've got an implementation unit, though, so that's all. Yeah, that's all sorted. That's all sorted. Um, but in terms of, you know, what they have been good at is raising the minimum wage, because that's literally the stroke of a pen, and and leaving things for other people to do, right? So, yeah, and, and there has, you know, David Parker has certainly been one of the busier ministers in environment, and so he's, you know... Th- it's, it's quite hard to transform the environment after 150 years or so of degrading it to the point that it's can't even swim in your rivers anymore and the rest of it. I mean, transformation of our whenua and our waterways and our marine life and the rest of it, and we've got all the reports that show how poorly we've done over that time, is it's not going to happen like overnight, like Rachel says, <laughs> will it? The but I guess that's what legislation's for, is to, to tweak it and mm. to make things start to move in the, and, in the right way. And look, you know, what we saw over the weekend in Buller and in Westport especially, you know, some kind of terrifying, I mean, both, both, both in terms of the two challenges of climate change in terms of adaptation and in terms of mitigation, the the reforms that are mm. underway are trying to address both of those things to a, to, to, to a great degree. And it's there's no arguing that it's a real thing, right? <laughs> no, no, ab- absolutely. But the, the challenge you get is actually getting people to make sacrifices that require them to either do work or pay money. Right. So we've had the ETS in place for about 10 years. It's only really had teeth for the last few couple of years. Um it adds, say, ten cents to your petrol per mm. litre, mm. right? But but you don't see that on the receipt. You know, it's just sort of mm. absorbed into these 
big fluctuations that petrol prices have. The farmers get told you have to fence off that area, you have to plant these trees, you have to, you know. But don't they get funding to fence it off? I don't, yeah. don't know. I'm pretty sure. But, that but it's still a thing they've got to do, right? It takes up mental space. It, it's like any regulatory change, you know, it actually does add to your workload. And Shouldn't you have been doing that already? Don't know, I'm not a farmer. But when you've got cows that are like, you know, in, in, the, in the waterways... You'd go, shit, that's a problem, because, you know, we now know that waterways can't have that much of that in there, and wouldn't you just fence it off? When you've got runoff going into streams, and your streams turned kind of brown and got algae all through it, what, what kind of responsibility do you have as a landowner? Yeah. I mean, because if I, mean, I walk around, I am, like, I'm, I'm a landowner, you know, I've got a house in Auckland, and when something like the tree is going to fall over and hit the neighbour's house, I take action. What's the mood in fielding? Fielding. I didn't get down there for the protest, but I imagine it would have been huge because it's a town of two halves fielding, farming community, and then, you know, a lot of poverty and people who are labouring jobs and the rest of it Mm. split down the middle, really. Um, I reckon there probably would have been a bit of, you know, raiki terai, that's what we say when you're the head, you know, a bit of headbutting down the main street because, you know, um, recently you saw uh, Tangata whenua, Mana Whenua down there Ngāti Kaufata Rangitāne mm. march to the uh, council and oh, demand yeah, but um, think, yeah. Māori wards and you know when I was growing up in fielding there was no presence of Mana Whenua mm. we didn't even say we were Māori at school in fact I've been talking to lots of people I've been catching up with that I went to school with and would say I don't even know you were Māori <laughs> <laughs> and, oh, and I turned up somewhere like I saw one of my mates who clearly looks Maori, but we were all just mm. we couldn't see back mm. then because we were prevented. It's just something that you didn't want to be. Yeah, I saw someone recently at Waitara, and I was like, "Oh my gosh, are you from here, bro?" And he's like, "Yeah," and I was like, "Wow," had no no idea of that's fielding, but it's changed and good. And so Ngati Kofata and Rangitani and those we are starting to step up. And, and take their position, you know, and change the face of what fielding looks like. And I imagine all little towns around New Zealand are experiencing that kind of renaissance of, in the presence of mana whenua. Hmm. Mm. We can do a debate in fielding as well, I think, by yep. the sounds of it. Yeah, demand the debate, that's number 19. Um, we're going to talk about, we were going to talk about a bit about David Seymour, but maybe we'll save that for... For next time, I just as I, as we as we've been discussing, I've had eight press releases come in from the Act Party. Oh. He's very <laughs> present. The very very present. Yeah, yeah um, and and the, there was a there was a poll recently in which um, David Seymour ranked. It was the UMR, wasn't it? That was leaked. Twelve percent. Um, um, but um, do you want to have do you have any quick thoughts on on whether David Seymour is now the true leader of the opposition party? Ben. Yeah, I mean, I, I think ACT leaders in the past have had that sort of de facto role when National is weak, um, and Seymour is certainly setting the direction in the sense that, you know, we've heard that National isn't polling, and that leaves the uh, sort of options that either Collins is just following her instinct or a hunch on all of this sort of... On, on what she's pursuing, or she's following ACT's lead because they're doing a lot of polling, mm. um, which would be a mistake, I think, because ACT is not a major party that needs to get onto that 50th percentile of the vote. Um, but, you know, they certainly do seem to be following very closely along. Uh, they, there certainly doesn't seem to be a lot of policy differentiation between the two parties. And, you know, look, Seymour is doing it better than National right now. I would say uh, they're, much the fast, things, they're much faster and more agile. One of the, the most media. extraordinary things, and I and I say this, and I don't, I don't mean this uh, fatuously at all, is that the 10 new BMPs, yeah. no one has gone completely gonzo. <laughs> you know, yeah, he's, he's like a it, tight ship. That is r- truly oh, extraordinary. It, right? it really speaks to their candidate selection and their recruitment. Um, well, and, and also their internal people. And, and the internal yeah, people. The back office is yeah. just that, that core group. National of people, could use a couple that, of those people. That, that core group of people who were there, you know, during the, the one, you know, time in the wilderness. Mm. My former colleague, Brooke Van Velden, who's now the deputy uh, leader um, and the whip, I think. 
um, Andrew Cattells, who's the chief of staff, Seymour himself, mm. you know, the, and then some backroom guys who've been around for years and years. But in opposition, eh, this happens because remember when the Greens had big numbers in opposition next to Labour? Yeah. And um, so the, that main party kind of yeah. loses its way and yeah, it yeah. kind of rolls over. Yeah, there was over a time where, where, where Russell, Norman and Metodea today were, were kind of leading had taken that. the debate. Um, uh, we got to go. Very quickly, as also we were going to mention briefly the Freedom Day oh, yeah. in the UK, which has been declared. Boris Johnson July the 19th. We won't pinned. really know for about 14 days how it's going to turn out. <laughs> but it is, <laughs> it is kind of... Horrifying in a way. Horrifying. I mean, I've talked. I talked to. I talked to various friends in the UK who, who uh, say that there's just they've got that like they have to open up. The, the and and you go well that seems crazy. Like mm. the the numbers don't back that up. They're well, people would people would revolt. And that's not borne out. I don't think by the polling particularly. But there is seems to be a kind of general mood there that well we've tried everything. We're vaccinated quite high le- high level now, so let's go for it. But they then create this fucking petri dish for. A more variants to emerge. Yeah, that's a, the kind of scariest crazy. thing is that, that just allowing it to kind of and re- and the unknowns, the long COVID stuff. Yeah, you know, long COVID. like pe- people who may not become massively symptomatic may not end up in hospital. Hospital uh, hospitalisation is down. People, uh, people, when people say to me, "Oh, you know, we've got to learn to live with it," because people say that all the time. Someone said it to, it to me at the weekend, and I thought, you know, I actually know quite a few. A couple of people have had COVID and who are living with long COVID. Mm. And, you know, one in particular is a friend of mine's daughter who is constantly sick, mm. constantly sick. Mm. And um, that's the long COVID. So who knows what her, what's going to turn out for her. I mean, it does, you do wonder whether if this was, well, should the UK be on New Zealand's high risk country list now? I mean, why is it not? Well, I, I would have thought that it, well, I mean, we don't we don't have a because we don't want the new. Variants. We only have high risk countries. No, right no, now, we don't. From, you remember you know, when we we remember when we oh, shut off internal travel from India, right? Yeah, yeah and then it was yeah. reopened on the basis that there was a new category, which yeah. was an update on the previous one, which meant that different criteria had yeah, to be sure uh, had to be met in order to travel from those those those. Yeah. Does places. the next ten years look like um, that we travel with? with not high-risk countries and then we just do hard borders to, you know, the high-risk countries because, you know, you can vaccinate your whole population and then a new variant can absolutely screw that. Yeah, I mean, we we have to open up at some point. I think one thing that maybe we don't appreciate here is just how crazy everyone in the UK has been going over the past year and a half. You know, I mean, we, we... you see in Australia, you know, a lot of people in Sydney are finding it really hard to deal with their first proper lockdown. And it's been, what, a couple of weeks or something? Um, you know, th- we have people, you know, people in the UK, a lot of them haven't, you know, really seen anyone socialised, no. gone out yeah. in, in the sense. And remember, a lot of them, you know, if you're in London, you're living in a cramped little apartment. You know, you're not you're not in the backyard or whatever. But there was still there was still an opportunity to... Open up some elements, like yes, people can yeah. go to the beach. Yes, people should go to the park. But when you're in, inside, put a mask on, make that home mm. roll, and this yeah, is yeah, like, nah. yeah. And then they're doing this track and tracing with everyone getting pinged, oh, yeah. which is great. You know, including the prime minister, who for two hours was going to be on a pilot scheme that <laughs> exempted him. <laughs> they realised that possibly that wasn't a great idea. When you anyway, the whole thing is just an absolute clusterfuck. But let's finish. Let's stop. I feel like we have satisfied the demands for the debate. Uh, we'll be bringing to you more to, debates. About up to demand the debate number 19. We demand the debate number 19. <laughs> we demand that people now demand that this particular debate reach Maybe its Maybe people end. demand that this podcast be done. Be finished. Yeah, for the day. Kia ora. Kia ora. This is Climate Adaptation. We are the Portiki of the tile. And the words of those keeping the home fires burning. It's more than just going along and planting some trees. You've got to be able to defend that place to the end of your life. We have the solutions. We just need to come back to the belief in ourselves as rangatira. Join me, Nadine Huda and Ruia Apirehama, the Kopapa Korangi Series 2, Ahika. Brought to you by Te Komato Te Tonga, the Deep South Challenge. Out now on the Spin-Off Podcast Network or wherever you get your podcasts. Kia ora e te iwi, te Butler here. 
podcast manager at The Spinoff. If you enjoy listening to our podcasts, consider supporting our mahi by signing up to become a Spinoff member at thespinoff.co.nz slash donate. The Spinoff Podcast Network.